welcome to our podcast, There's But a Scratch, Fact and Fiction About the Middle Ages. In today's episode of returning to my roots as an Anglo-Saxon historian and asking the question, was King Athelred really unready? And to answer that question, I'm honored to have as my very special guest and co-host, Dr. Levy Roach from the University of Exeter in the UK. Levy is one of the very best historians of Anglo-Saxon England. His expertise in German medieval history has enabled him to place Anglo-Saxon England into a wider continental perspective. His publications include four books, Kingship and Consent in Anglo-Saxon England, which won the Whitfield Prize, Forgery and Memory at the End of the First Millennium, which has been published recently by Princeton University Press, Empires of the Normans, Pegasus Books, 2022, and the subject of today's episode, Athelred the Unready, published by Yale University Press for their English Monarch series in 2016, and winner of the Longman History Today Prize, given to the author who has done the most, quote, to promote the study, publication, and accessibility of history to a wide audience. Levy, welcome. Thank you, Richard. That's very kind of you. Our listeners have already encountered King Athelred the Unready in our previous episodes about the St. Bryce's Day Massacre and the assassination of Athelred's older half-brother and predecessor, King Edward the Martyr. If you are new to the podcast or missed those episodes, don't be embarrassed if you've never heard of King Athelred the Unready. Anglo-Saxon history isn't widely studied in the U.S. J.R.R. Tolkien popularized Old English literature, particularly the poem Beowulf, but that really hasn't carried over to history. Athelred was the longest reigning Anglo-Saxon king. He came to the throne as a child in 978 and died in 1016. His claim to fame, or in this case infamy, is that he was the English king who lost to the Vikings. It's characteristic of Athelred's reign that its greatest surviving work of literature, the poem, The Battle of Malden, is an epic account of heroic defeat. Until fairly recently, historical accounts of Athelred's reign have focused on his futile attempts to counter increasingly devastating Viking raids that culminated in two Danish conquests of England, the first by King Swain Forkbeard in the year 1013, and the second by Swain's son, Canute the Great, in 1017, the year following Athelred's death. By the 12th century, Athelred had acquired an unflattering, punning nickname that has stuck with him, the Unready. At least in popular memory, Athelred stands in opposition to his great-great-grandfather, Alfred the Great. Alfred is the symbol of English victory, resilience, and glory, and Athelred the symbol of of defeat and failure. But historians over the last 50 years have been reevaluating both the man and his reign. To answer the question I posed, is it fair to call Athelred the unready? We need to place him in his historical context. So, Levy, why don't you begin us off? Yes, absolutely. So, King Athelred is the son of King Edgar, who is one of these very powerful and influential figures in 10th century England, and who arguably is one of the real architects for a kind of unified English kingdom. So his reign is a long one, quite a peaceful one, famously. And it's in this period that many of the territorial gains this kingdom has made, So, because this is a kingdom that's originally been based in Wessex in the south of England, only one part of later England has expanded rapidly into the Midlands and the north and the east, largely at the expense of uh, Viking settlement and uh, Scandinavian kingdoms there. So this dynasty has seen this kind of astronomical rise and this huge territorial expansion to form essentially what we now know as England, or most of it. Uh, But it's in Edgar's reign, the reign of Ethelred's father, that then they finally take stock and that kind of administrative structures are created to try to rule this in in a somewhat coherent manner. His reign also sees huge amounts of religious patronage. So particularly, he's famous as a supporter of the so-called monastic reform movement, a movement to kind of rejuvenate monastic, but also religious life kind of in general across the kingdom. And the kind of message of all of this is one faith, one kingdom, one means of practice. And so this is a 
hugely important period for England, a period of kind of ferment. And this is the world Ethelred is born into. Crucially, though, he is not born of Edgar's first wife. Ethelred's mother was Edgar's second or third wife, Queen Elfrith. Elfrith figures prominently in the episodes in Anglo-Saxon murder mystery and wicked medieval women and the monks who loathe them. She was one of our three so-called wicked women, a characterization that I think most unjust. Based on circumstantial evidence, she may have been complicit in the assassination of her stepson, King Edward the Martyr, but against that, she was also a fervent supporter of the Benedictine monastic reform, and by all accounts, a most pious lady. Yes, precisely. So his mother is this kind of domineering figure at court in this period. And so his father's had two previous unions, both at a very young age, and in one case clearly separated from his spouse. In the first case, it's possible she dies. We don't really know the full circumstances. But crucially, he has both a son and a daughter from two different women before he marries Alfred, who's Ethelred's mom. But we know actually very little about these two previous spouses, and that itself is kind of significant, because in contrast, Alfred, as you say, is this hugely significant figure, and she's the first a consort, first royal consort of this West Saxon dynasty who's accorded the title queen. Previously, they're called king's wife, and that kind of encapsulates their role up to this point. That they're kind of an adjunct to the monarch. They only have a position at court by dint of marriage, whereas Alfred seems to be a power in her own right. She's called queen fairly early on. Probably at the moment of her marriage to Edgar, he grants her land in a very important transaction. And crucially, she seems to have been consecrated into a role. So she's been anointed queen and crowned in the same way Edgar has. And that sort of imbues her with divine grace in a similar manner. And crucially, that's a kind of ceremony you can't therefore undo. So it kind of places her in a unique and new position as we're seeing kind of queenship really as an office emerge. And so his mother is this hugely important person at court. And that, uh, as you well know, then raises questions as to what should happen if or when Edgar dies. Because should the kingdom go to his eldest son, who is his son of his uh, first wife probably, or should it not go to one of his two younger sons, because he goes on to have two sons with Alfred, who are the sons of a full legitimate queen. And it's important to recognize that we're not talking about a succession that's based purely on primogeniture. Royal elections in the 10th century had less to do with principles of succession than with practical considerations. In particular, the ability of the candidates to marshal support. Kingship, at least in theory, was an elective office. The great men of the realm, lay and ecclesiastic, who constituted the late king's witan, chose the new king from among those deemed throne-worthy. In 8th century Wessex, this had meant any man who could claim descent from the 6th century founder of the royal line, Cherdic. By the 10th century, the field had been narrowed to members of King Alfred's lineage. Rather than having hard and fast rules, there are perhaps more guidelines for how these things should go. And so greater proximity by birth counts for something but it doesn't count for everything. And one of the things we can observe earlier on in the 10th century is that successions tend to have to be most peaceful in this period when it's brother to brother. Uh, yes. And that seems to have been the norm that you kind of go down one generation then run through all the brothers, then go the next. Yeah, which makes sense. If what you have is a kingdom that is constantly at war, you need to have an adult or someone who's nearly an adult on the throne Yes, exactly. And then one of the things that is also notable is Edgar, of course, has this peaceful reign, but he succeeds his own brother, Eadwe. And there had been much more uncertainty when his elder brother, Eadwe, becomes king, so, because then it had skipped a generation. So each time we see it move between the generations, there's a lot more question marks, it seems, because as you say, where there's a brother in the wings, he's normally an adult male in his prime with real experience in war and politics. So he can kind of do the job from day one, whereas you skip a generation and there's a lot more question marks. Is this teenager man in his late teens, early 20s, really ready or as ready? When the 32-year-old Edgar suddenly died in 975, the situation was different. For one thing, Edgar had no brother to succeed him, only two young sons. 
but the need to have a proven war leader on the throne was less pressing than it had been during previous successions, and that owed to Edgar's success in maintaining order within his realm and exerting hegemony over neighboring rulers. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle boasts that, quote, there was no fleet so proud nor raiding army so strong that fetched itself carrion among the English race while the noble king governed the royal seat. If necessary, England could afford to have a child king in 975. And so it's at these moments that we seem to see these fissures appear in these kind of uh, uh, different opinions as to what should be the key criteria. And of course, for the major magnates at court, everyone wants to back a winner. And so they're trying to line up and guess who will be the next king, but also who will benefit them most. So you kind of want right. your friend to be king as well. So there's a, this all of this calculus going on, and we can kind of see this happening a bit behind the scenes at Edgar's court already, because in a document I know you know well, the refoundation charter of the new minster in Winchester, one of these reform monastic houses, it's kind of a uh, one of these prizes of his reform movement where they're kind of showcasing this new, pure, reformed form of monasticism. In the witness list to that document, it's noteworthy that when his sons appear, and he has two, Ethelred's yet to be born, but his it's noteworthy there that Ethelred's elder brother appears above his half-brother, who is older than both of them. Um, and so it's an inversion of the natural order that we see in other documents of this period. And crucially, his elder brother is co called the legitimate son of the king, whereas his half-brother is just said to be begotten of the same king. No talk of legitimacy. And then when his mother comes after the two brothers, the two half brothers, she is called legitimate folks. So it's kind of this, this legitimacy sandwich, as I sometimes describe it by students of legitimate son, begotten, legitimate wife. You connect the dots as to what that person in between might have been. And of course, what this document's trying to do or implying is that he is illegitimate. He is a bastard son and therefore potentially less worthy of the succession. And the document is associated with Bishop Athelwald of Winchester, whom we know was Queen Alfred's friend and political ally. One of the things I find most interesting about this is that the succession question seems to have split the Anglo-Saxon clergy. On the one hand, you had Ethelwald firmly supporting Athelred, but on the other hand, you have Archbishop Dunstan and possibly Archbishop Oswald who were supporting the succession of Edward. I've never quite understood what Dunstan's motivations were in all of this. Yeah, so I think some of this, or a significant amount of this, as you say, is coming down to different factions at court. So it's noteworthy that, as I've already kind of alluded to, that all the other charters we have at this period, which have these witness lists, where the brothers appear, they always appear in the, as it were, correct order with Edward, who is this elder half-brother, Edgar's firstborn. He appears first in all other documents. Second, if there is a second there, is Edmund Ethelred's full brother. And that seems to be probably actually the consensus that most people expect. Uh, and it's what we see, although there's often succession disputes, as you've alluded to. More often than not, when the succession skips a generation, while there might be a dispute, it's the eldest son who typically gets it because he's best positioned, he's the most mature, most experienced. And of course, that is what happens here. So it's probably what most people are anticipating. So I don't know whether or not Dunstan's doing this out of conviction, simply this is the right thing, or simply out of a kind of wanting to back the right course. So he, he's likely to get it anyway, let's support him. But it is noteworthy that within these, these kind of reform circles, these circles that have been dominating the ecclesiastical hierarchy, there is this fissure between what seems to be Dunstan circles, possibly also those of Oswald, the third great reformer, the Archbishop of right. York and Bishop of Worcester, who we suspect as you, it also backs Edward, the elder half-brother, and then Athelwald of Winchester, who, as you know, he's the one who, in fact, writes the text of that Newminster Refoundation Charter. The Newminster is his abbey. He oversees this, and he is a leading political ally of Queen Alfred. 
And so I think one of the things that he's trying to do, and actually those around him and Alpha are trying to do, but perhaps not everyone's convinced by, is construct a new model of queenship, but also a new model of marriage, one that emphasizes more church regulations on marriage. And so one of the things that is happening in this period is that it's a, an era in which there's a lot more gray area between what a consort is and a wife. And uh, we've yet to get to a period where the church has to bless marriages for them to be legitimate or otherwise. So there could be a lot of movement between and so on between different statuses within these kinds of things. And so one of the things I think that Athelwald, Alfred and their group are trying to do is by constructing her as this anointed queen and constructing her marriage as bestowing this on her, they're also implicitly suggesting that her predecessors were perhaps Edward, perhaps Edgar's consorts, or his, his concubines, not fully legitimate wives like her. And so I think they're 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 aware that there is these these uncertainties, and they're trying to iron out the rules and regulations in a way that, of course, will benefit their side. Um, and Dunstan may well simply be a more traditionalist here, or or not see it that way at all, and see it as the case that Edgar's had multiple legitimate marriages. Which would explain also why Alfred appears in the Regularis Concordia as the protector and advocate of nunneries alongside her husband, that they're given these parallel positions as king and queen, which again supports the idea that Alfred is holding a position which is new and that Athelwold is supporting that position since he's the author of the Regularis Concordia. Exactly. I was just about to bring that one in indeed, because that's the crucial thing is that, as you say, I think we've got two things going on here. On the one hand, in objective terms, Alfred, even in sources outside Athelwold circles, clearly looming larger than previous queen. Uh, uh, and clearly there's kind of a new model emerging of a queen who is a real uh, partner in rule with the king rather than just a, 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 a kind of added extra, his spouse. At the same time, our most eloquent sources are those from Applewald circles, which is telling us something, because I think they're the ones constructing this model. Um, mm-hmm. And the degree to which it's accepted everywhere is, is probably a very good question. And the fact that we then get the succession dispute, I think, is noteworthy. Because on the one hand, while we've seen lots of them before, uh, it's actually not surprising that Edward, the elder half-brother, wins out. Ethelred's really quite a bit younger. So in the meantime, his elder full brothers actually died. Edmund might have been a decent alternative candidate, but Ethelred's really a, a boy. Ethelred couldn't have been older than nine at this point. He may have been as young as six or seven. So he's really very young, whereas Edward is probably in his mid to late teens. So a really substantial difference, whereas his elder full brother might have been kind of 13, 14, 15, you know, a bit more uh, uh, eligible. So in a sense, the question, the the surprising thing in a way is that anybody thinks Ethelred would make a sensible candidate, given how young his father dies. His father's only in his 30s. And if Ethelred becomes king, it's really the... The rule is going to be a regency, three people in particular. One would be Alfred, who would remain powerful, and the other two would be uh, Elderman Alfhera of Mercia, who is, again, a very strong supporter of Alfred, and Athelwold, Bishop Athelwold. That would be that would be the trinity that would be ruling England if Athelred actually did become king. Exactly. And that's probably one of the reasons why people back him is, is I suspect some of those like Applewood must have known it was always a bit of a long shot, but it was worth risking because of the potential gains. And I think they realized they were due to lose out either way, because in a sense, their star had been in ascendance since Edgar married Alfred, who was their political ally. Um, and so they marry him probably 964. He dies um, in 975. So for this 11 years, they had been dominating court um, right. and closely allied to her. But of course, the kind of elephant in the room then is in that context, the succession, because Edgar's eldest son is not her son and has no particular reason to get on with his stepmother, not least since her interests lie in the succession of her own sons, Edward, the future martyrs, competitors for the throne, his threat. So you've got, on the one hand, they've been hugely influential. On the other hand, the succession 
if it goes the way that it looks likely to go, is likely to go badly for them. So it's worth it for them because they, they're going to lose out a bit in terms of political capital anyway to take that risk of saying, let's not see if we can get Ethelred on the throne anyway. One solution to disputed elections in the past was to divide the kingdom. That's what happened with Edwy and Edgar. Edwy, the senior brother, succeeding to Wessex, and Edgar succeeding to Mercia, and apparently regarding his brother as his overlord. No, and it's noteworthy that there's no discussion of it, as far as we can tell. Because as you say, that might have been the obvious solution. And the fact that it doesn't, it perhaps takes us back to some of those ideas of religious unity and political unity that his father had been so kind of imbued with, and even people like Athelwald really contributed towards. I don't think they wanted a divided kingdom. They wanted a kingdom for Athelwald. With all due respect to Sarah Foote and Tom Holland, perhaps we should be talking about Edgar rather than Athelstan as being the first true king of England. I'd be more than happy with that. I mean, I think it's lines in the sand. We're dealing with the process. And so everybody's going to want to plunk for their favorite monarch as the one who sees the making of England. Um, and to be honest, I think we could bring Ethelred into the picture as well, because if Edgar yes. is the one who creates it, Ethelred is the one who then realizes it in his reign, uh, particularly under the crucible of external threat. Right. So we have a election and the election goes for Edward and Edward turns out not to be not to be the king that maybe his supporters really hoped him to be, because the reign is a chaotic reign. It's dominated by what some historians like to call the anti-monastic reaction as unhappy noble families who felt that they had land extorted from them for these reform monasteries start to grab that land back. And England looks like it's not quite as united under Edward because of the rivalries of these great noble families and the inability of this young king to control those rivalries. And to judge from Bertworth of Ramsey's Life of St. Oswald, Edward the Martyr had some significant personality problems as king. He was a violent young man. He was... Um, irascible, and maybe because of the disputes over the election, he seems to have generated a lot of enmity from his father's court. So, yes. So, as you said, I think Beerfest is a very interesting source for this, because he's a contemporary writer um, writing around the year 1000. Um, and in his life of Oswald, which you mentioned there, he mentions Edward's reign and mentions though also that he's martyred and mentions there's a cult of him. So he's talking of him as a saint and yet still says he beat people too much and basically describes him as a bit of a rotter who becomes a saint because he's martyred. Only and because he's him, martyred. Only because he's martyred. So it's in death that he actually fulfills his sanctity rather than actually in life. So as you say, the impression of his reign is of kind of disorder and of uncertainty. And I think what makes it very hard to gauge is the fact that he's only on the throne three years or a bit under. And it's quite typical to have early sections of reigns be so much tumultuous. We can't get much of a handle on monarchs. You know, Athelstan, one of our great earlier monarchs of this dynasty, his early years are a bit hard to make out. Even Edgar, in a way, has first been raised to the kingship as a counterpart to his brother in the north. So it's not uncommon to have these uncertainties. What's hard to know is what Edward would have looked like if he'd got over those. And maybe he wasn't capable of doing so, because, of course, he then is brought down and is killed. So he may well have exacerbated the existing problems. Um, but it's hard to get much of a sense of, as you say, him of an individual. But there certainly are voices that are by no means unsympathetic to him in some senses, that treat him a saint, as a saint, but who also say, actually, no, wasn't, wasn't a great king. And there is now a interesting problem. There really is only one legitimate claimant to the throne. Athelred is it. I mean, he is the Athling. But Archbishop Dunstan is reluctant to consecrate Athelred as king until the body of his brother is found, because the martyrdom has a really kind of nasty wrinkle to it. Edward was martyred as he was going on a visit. As I discussed in an earlier episode, 
King Edward was murdered, or if you prefer, martyred, on a visit to an estate belonging to his half-brother and stepmother. Ertfirth believed that the murderers were members of Queen Alfred's household. He doesn't finger Alfred or Athelred as responsible for the crime, however. On the contrary, he explicitly states that neither was present at the killing, which is really prudent given that Athelred was king at the time that Burfirth wrote The Life of St. Oswald. What is certain is that no one was ever punished for the regicide. And as you say, that these factual divides are what brings an end as well to Edward's reign and brings Ethelred to the throne, that where there's the initial succession dispute, um, but there's clearly a lot of sour grapes. And as you say, he is then martyred by supporters, he is executed and killed by supporters of Ethelred. And the interesting thing is that there seems to be a lot of Concern and upset about the principle set by this in terms of regicide. That, uh, and one can understand this, even for Ethelred, actually. This is, you know, part of him is pro- pro- probably happy, but a part of him must be concerned. You don't really like to see crowned heads rolling if you're uh, a, a prince. No. Next no. in line to the throne. It seems to be a great deal of soul searching. He's coming to the throne very much under a cloud. And as you say, there's this long wait of over a year before he's crowned. And this is probably because of the need to kind of find some closure. And one of the things they're able to do in this period, at least reportedly, is find the body of his brother, take it out and then bury it appropriately. Because crucially, the people who do this are said to bury it on unconsecrated ground. What probably happens, of course, is that they've killed Edward. They don't want to be caught red-handed. They don't want people to necessarily know who they were who did this. And so they ditch his body somewhere nondescript. But crucially, this is a major problem in terms of Christian doctrine because it should be buried on consecrated ground, should be treated with dignity, and it means that you can't then identify who's done this. And I, I, I do think, I know opinions vary here as to whether or not this isn't a master plan of Alfred or um, Ethelred or if they aren't pulling all of the strings. But I think some of the soul-searching of contemporary sources is based upon the fact that it was symp- sympathizers of those who did it, but they hid the body so they wouldn't, no one would know precisely who did it. They, they didn't want to call attention to themselves to get the credit because they knew, on the one hand, it helped their faction, on the other, it was a huge sin and a crime. And so there's no body, there's no possibility for closure, and that year is used to find it. What we don't know is whether or not the bones or the body they find is actually that of Edwards, or whether eventually they perhaps do have to pragmatically plump for a body that everyone can agree is Edward. I suspect that Ulfair found a body that looked enough like the late teenage king to pass muster. After all, there are no photographs in this period. It's sort of like an Anglo-Saxon Martin Gear. It would also explain the reports that the body was uncorrupted. An incorruptible body, after all, is a sign of sanctity as the nuns of the convent at Shaftesbury, where Edward was to be now buried with royal honors, would have trumpeted. Exactly. And that's probably already in the room when they're doing this, because there is this tradition of martyrdom, that it's very hard to be a monarch and a saint in the Middle Ages, certainly by this period, that these are ideals that don't easily sit side by side. But for Edward, he's not been on the throne too long. He's still been quite young as he's been martyred. Um, and so he ends up conforming to, in terms of how his sanctity is built up, this idea of the cult of the holy innocence, that is the children that Herod had executed in the, the attempt to get Christ executed. And the uh, principle of the holy innocence in their cult was not that they were saints by virtue of innate sanctity or their deeds, but by virtue of their innocence. He's an anointed king. He's a, he's a Rex Christus. And exactly. therefore... And Berford's depiction of his assassination is clearly modeled on the on the taking of Christ. So yes, it's the betrayal of Judas Iscariot. Yeah, and, uh, it's, it's all done. It's all done very, very carefully about uh, about that. It's not the best succession. Uh, you have basically a original sin in Athelred's reign. Everyone knows this, as you say, so that there is the, 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 the there is this kind of sense that even if he didn't orchestrate this, and, and obviously we don't actually know 100% who orchestrated it. And I don't think he did. I mean, he's, a young, 
He's a young kid. Wow. I really don't. I do think that there's a lot of conspiracy going on. What always struck me about this is that no king ever travels without a retinue. Even if Edward, he's supposed to have had a small bodyguard, he was accompanied by them. Nobody else was killed. Nobody else seems to have resisted the murder. And nobody else reported the murder. It's, yes. it, it does, I'm not usually a fan of conspiracies, but this really does seem to me to be a conspiracy. Yeah, no, and I think there is also the fact that Ethelred gets stained by it anyway because he benefits from it. And it's a bit like exactly. you were drawing analogies with the mo with much more modern history, but people like Ian Kershaw has talked of in the context of, say, you know, Hitler's rule in Germany, working towards the Fuhrer, the fact that there would be people who do things they thought he'd want, even without instruction. That, that, that right. the kind of thing around that. And I think that's something that you see a lot at medieval courts of, you know, the most famous example a bit like this is the, the, the Beckett case, where on balance, we don't think that had Henry II said, hey, go kill Beckett, because it actually makes things worse. Everyone knew that at least in moments, he really wanted Beckett killed. And will no one rid me of this toil? So I suspect that's one of those kinds of moments where the support of Ethelred and of Alfred, crucially, they know they want Edward got rid of, even if they're not giving them orders to do this. So it, one could easily imagine a group taking a degree of initiative uh, off, the own, off their own bat, knowing that ultimately this will benefit their faction and this is in the long term what they want. But as you say, it creates a whole mess for Ethelred. It's an even worse start to his reign than his brother's because his brother's started with factional dispute. His starts with regicide. With regicide. And which is the reason why God punishes the realm because God brings back the Vikings. Exactly. As ye shall sow, so shall ye reap. Uh, in terms of these things, words that would have been known by many contemporaries. And this is, as you said, a crucial thing. So Ethelred's reign, it gets started. We then get a de facto regency, as you kind of alluded to earlier, would otherwise have had to do so, because Ethelred's still quite young. Yeah, 12 at the oldest. The, the early one. So, so, it, we, so we get these initial cagey years where it's hard to make much out, um, where his mum seems to be calling shots, Bishop Athelwald of Winchester, etc., um, and it's hard to make up much more than the old faction that had dominated his father's later years is now kind of back back at the forefront, but perhaps not doing a huge amount. It's kind of hard. Regency regimes tend to kind of not rock the boat. You kind of just hold course and wait till you have, you know, uh, a, 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 an adult kind of male set of hands on on the, the, the rudder. But what then happens is as Ethelred's edging towards his adult years, we then get a slew of deaths. So this A. Alderman Alfera, you mentioned already, who's hugely influential, close ally of his mother, dies in 983. And then 984, perhaps most crucially, Bishop Athelwald, who seems to have been the, the perhaps closest ally of his mum and a huge figure, a huge influence on Ethelred himself, who had, in fact, been a tutor to his father. So, so a huge influence on the, on the dynasty more generally. Athelwald dies in 984. And crucially, we can tell from the witness lists of charters, at the moment Athelwald dies, his mum disappears entirely from contemporary documents for the next nine years, overnight. There, there does seem to be a medieval theme of kings who succeed as children and have a regency, that when they leave the minority, what they do is they leave the minority with a vengeance, exactly. like Henry III in England was going to do later. And that they want now to be able to really rule, which means that their old advisors, who were really their old masters, are cast aside. Exactly. So there's an unusual moment that we see only really, at least in such stark terms, with child monarchs. Because, you know, new regimes has a tendency for them to react against the old, as we kind of see with Edward the Martyr and Ed uh, Edgar. But particularly with boy kings, we tend to get this unusual moment, because on the one hand, we first had the kind of regency years, but where normally there's a supportive relationship between mentors uh, and the future monarch uh, at, at a court, between their mother, people like Athold, um, it breaks down potentially here because suddenly they don't have the same set of interests. It's in Athold's interests and Althra's interests, his mum's interest, to have it to retain as much power as possible for as long as possible. 
It's in Ethelred's interest as the child monarch to take as much of that power as possible, as soon as possible. So whereas earlier, you know, in 975, when they're contesting succession, they're all united by a desire to get him on the throne. Now, suddenly, they're being pulled in different directions. Ethelred, like any good teenage boy, wants to be an adult and he's ready to do everything. Get out of my way, mom. I don't need your advice anymore. Um, and his mother and advisors are busy saying, no, 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 not so fast, one imagines. And that, that I think, explains the starkness of this, because as you say, we see it elsewhere with people like Henry III. And it certainly, in this case, seems to be pretty stark. His mother disappears entirely. We don't know if he kicks her out or if she leaves because she's so angry. But either way, it makes sense. And the moment being the death of her closest ally, uh, it kind of encapsulates this, that Ethelred is changing direction dramatically politically. Now that he was king in fact as well as name, Athelred seems to have cast off the influence of Bishop Athelwold and his mom with a vengeance, as he allowed his favorites to take lands belonging to monasteries. At the same time, Viking raiding, a local nuisance in the first years of his reign, grew more intense, culminating in the arrival of a large Viking fleet in 991, and the subsequent disastrous defeat of Eldamund Burtnothsford in the Battle of Malden. Molden marks the beginning of the series of devastating Viking raids that dominated the remainder of Athelred's reign. Athelred's failure to check those raids, which culminated in King Swain Falkbeard's brief ascent to the English throne and Athelred's own exile into Normandy, gained Athelred an unflattering nickname and ensured him an equally unflattering place in English historiography. Exactly. So, yeah. So, uh, as you say, poor Ethelred's reign, in a sense, it gets characterized by its final years, because there's kind of no doubt that even on the most sympathetic telling of his reign, and I think both, both you and I are at least broadly sympathetic to elements yes. of the challenges he's facing, um, but even on the most sympathetic telling, it ends in catastrophe. And our sources for his reign, at least our, our kind of coherent narratives, are all written after the effect in the aftermath of this, with awareness of this failure. And it's encapsulated by this later by name, which in Old English, as you say, is Unraid. So Athelred Unraid in Old English, which would basically be translated into modern English as something like, so his name means noble counsel, but by extension, good counsel uh, as a consequence. And Unraid is uncounsel, i.e. bad advice, poor counsel. So it's effectively saying, you know, good advice, uh, perhaps in, uh, to use the modern British idiom, good advice, my arse. Exactly. Oh, good counsel, my arse. You know, this is saying very much he didn't live up to his name. His name was meant to mean somebody who took and offered good counsel, and instead it was the complete inversion of it. Our mutual friend Anne Williams, in her excellent biography of Athelred, translates it as Athelred the ill-counseled king. It's possibly that, or it could be criticism of Athelred himself as a policymaker. As you put it, noble policy? My ass. The accusation, then, is that the policies he followed were unwise or foolish policies. Mm. The question I have is, was he ill counseled? Is that a fair thing to say he was ill counseled? So, as you say, there's a bit of an ambiguity in the original term because unre could be actually both an adjective describing him, so ill counseled, or could be a noun, which is, I think, the one you're, you're lumping for a bit yes. more there, referring to noble counsel, bad counsel. Um, and as you say, certainly one of the things that does run through his reign is the discussion and concern around counsel. I tend to think on balance, that he's not necessarily ill counseled, But what he does do, that arguably sows some of the seeds of his destruction, not all of them, is he does show a tendency to move between factions and favoring different factions, which is quite dramatically. And again, this is something we see of, you know, certain monarchs throughout the Middle Ages, but I think is a specially common phenomenon of child monarchs. And I think this partly comes from kind of growing up already on the throne, Yes. where there's the machinations at court around you growing up in an environment where there's few people you could genuinely trust, even more so than a, a, as an heir being a, a monarch on the throne. 
Um, and so I think this often does breed a mistrust. And again, we see this a bit with Henry III's reign later in England, where again, you get these sharp factional shifts between these people are in the Savoyards and so on. Um, and so too in Ethelred's reign, we have that period in the 980s when he breaks from his mum and the regency, when it, my new favourites, my people, my, my priorities... Then he breaks with that in the 990s, starting in 993. He invites mum back to court, brings in a new faction, much more like his father's advisors, often relatives of them, sons of them, and so on. So kind of, you know, then then corrects tax almost all the way back politically. But then in his later years, um, we get then yet another group emerging around this kind of gray eminence, Andrew Strayona, who... Is, is arguably the real power behind the throne in his very final years. So there does seem to be this tendency to have an in-group at any particular time and a particularly powerful one, and in a sense that he perhaps listens too readily to whoever is whispering in his, in his ear at any moment. It also struck me that he was he was reluctant to trust the old god. He was reluctant to trust the great families, mm -hmm. uh, the families of Athelstan and Half-King, he was never keen on replacing Elderman. Mm -hmm. He much preferred to deal with Reeves than with Elderman. Elderman would come from the great families. The Reeves would come from lesser families. They'd be more controllable. I think that the minority does shape his attitude towards the great families. I and one that. of the appeals of the Iadric, Strayona, is Iadric is really not a great man until he becomes a royal favorite. Uh, as you say, that no, that I think there is this distrust of the powers that be. And I think the Reeves are also interesting structurally there because the the particularly Shire Reeves, the future sheriffs, yes, i.e., as as these figures that stand beneath the aldermen, who we might liken to later earls. We've got the monarch, we then have the aldermen, and then beneath them the Shire Reeves, one for each shire or county. And as you say, the Shire Reeves first appear in his father's reign and really first become prominent, actually. Many of many many shires and shires we first hear of in Ethelred's reign. That's where we first see the real operation in judicial context and things like that. Right. He seems to rely much more on them. And I think some of this is, as you say, perhaps favoring a, a new group, a perhaps counterweight, uh, a level just slightly below the super magnates. I think another element of it is also the workings out of things his father's already done. And I think that's one of the things that, one of the areas where Ethelred's reign gets a bad rap, a bad rap is that some of the problems of his reign he's created, but some are actually long-term problems that have been seeded by his father. And so the Shire Reeves are something his father institutes as, in his, as, yes. as you know, a, 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 as a new kind of uh, office. And I think to a certain extent they were bound to conflict with the old, the old A. Alderman. And we see it happening under Ethelred's reign because they've had time to bed in. Um, likewise, I think some of the religious ideas that drove reform, uh, as you know, I tend to believe are some of the ideas that also then lead to Ethelred when things get bad, when Vikings attack, him to identify this as the wages of sin and encourages introspection rather than perhaps military action as the top priority. But again, that's a kind of, it's a view that he's actually got from his father. It's not purely of his own creation. So I think there's some interesting signs there of problems that he's perhaps exacerbated, but that are that he's ultimately inherited from dad. No, I agree with you entirely. And I think that it's very, very important to realize that the Battle of Walden in 991 is a real turning point. I think it's what generates the 993 mm. uh, series of charters in which Athelred decries the ignorance of youth being misled and is all penitent and is going to become a good king. And I really do think that Athelred's change of heart, his penitence, was a response to the Battle of Walden. Is one of the things I was thinking as a military historian is when was the last time England actually had major battles? The last large-scale military action in England had been during the reign of Athelred's great uncle, King Eadred. In 948, Eadred had ravaged Northumbria to punish the Northumbrians for having broken their oath to him by taking the Norseman Eric Bloodaxe as their king. There's no evidence that any battles occurred during this ravaging expedition. The last attested battle in England before Malden was King Athelstan's celebrated victory at Brunenburg in 937. Brunenburg was also the last time before Malden that an English elderman had fallen in combat. So news of the decisive defeat of an English army at Malden 
and even more dramatically, the death of Elderman Burtnoth in battle must have shocked the English political nation. In a devoutly religious age, the most reasonable explanation is that God is punishing the king and the kingdom for their wickedness. Exactly. And I think in this case, it then is compounded with the fact that he's taken this new direction against his mother. So as you mentioned, this battle of mold and this first major defeat in 991, crucially, this comes seven years after he's distanced himself from his old regents and his previous group of advisors and struck out on his own. And I think this, this is all now coming to roost suddenly for, for, for him and those around him. In the next couple of years, we have no charges issue, no real sense of what's going on. And the very next document, as you know, is that 993 one, where it's, he publicly says, I'm sorry, and medieval monarchs like to apologize about as much as modern politicians. So this is huge stuff. This is, he's publicly eating humble pie. And then we actually see it enacted, perhaps most crucially, though, the, the group of favorites that dominate in the 990s thereafter are a completely different group, largely, that he, he's changed priorities. And so we do seem to see this embracing and accepting of our view that actually I got things badly wrong in the 980s. Um, and crucially in doing that, when he changed direction, he'd gone against the monastic reform party. He despoiled monastic houses. So it was quite easy to see why there might be divine punishment, that, that he'd and, not just been doing any old thing in those years. He'd been directly despoiling monasteries uh, and some of the key kind of ones that had been supported by his mum and his dad. What I really like about it is the irony. Athelred in that series of charters really is saying, I am Athelred Unrat. I've been badly advised. I know it now. I'm getting better advisors, and we're going back to a godly reign. Unfortunately, the Vikings don't disappear. Exactly. So I think for him, for his reign, if the Viking, if there had been a one-off Viking attack or just a couple, uh, and that had been it, things might then have gone fine, and it, we might have seen greater stability in a reign, perhaps not as successful as his father's, but not miles off, or perhaps a relatively nondescript and quiet reign thereafter. But as you say, crucially, the Vikings are following their own logic. They've got their own things going on in Scandinavia, state building, increasing centralization, and so on, all of which are driving, on the one hand, monarchs in Scandinavia to start doing Viking attacks themselves, which are of a much larger scale than many of the ones we've seen previously, but also the groups that have lost out to these new monarchs. So we're seeing large-scale sustained Viking attacks following their own logic, and they keep on coming because ultimately Ethelred's change of advisors is neither here nor there to them. They're not aware they're God's wrath. <laughs> they just keep doing what they do best, which is when they want well, they take it. And so they keep on taking it. This brings us to the modern meaning of the word unready. As we've said, when Ethelred's old English by name was coined, Unrad could either be an adjective, ill-advised, or a noun meaning poor policy. But the old English word unrad survives only in the modern English unread, which I guess implies that those who fail to read will be poorly advised. The similarity in sound between the Middle English noun unrad, poor advice, and the Middle English adjective unready, ill-prepared, coupled with the characterization of Athelred by medieval chroniclers as a slothful king, led to the gradual transformation of unrad into modern unready. Athelred, in 19th century historiography, became the ill-prepared rather than the ill-counseled king. He was still excoriated for his choice of favorites, in particular the notorious elderman Eatric Striona of Mercia, and Victorian historians echoed the Anglo-Saxon chronicle's lament that the war effort against the Vikings was constantly undermined by the treachery of the men whom Athelred chose to lead his armies and navies. But the focus of historians in the 19th and much of the 20th century was on the deficiencies of Athelred as king, in particular his policy of paying what they called Danegeld, and more generally on his failure to prepare the nation for the rigors of war. In the words of Rudyard Kipling, it's always a temptation for a rich and lazy nation to puff and look important and to say, though we know we should defeat you, we have not the time to meet you. We will therefore pay you cash to go away. 
Athelred in this historiography was condemned for failing to rouse that rich and lazy nation. Exactly. And as you say, this is the kind of thing that 19th century historians, the old kind of Whig school of historiography, who saw history uh, so famously mocked by Teller and Yetman in 1066 and all that as a series of good things and bad things, good yes. kings and bad kings. Um, and so Ethelred le leads to a new wave of Danes and things like that. But you've got the famous uh, statements of people like uh, Edward Augustus Freeman that alone of the male line of Cherdich, Ethelred may be identified as a bad man and a bad king. That This heavily moralistic tone that this fits wonderfully for, because for, for them, history is the gallery of good examples, but also the holding up uh, of moral turpitude. So in a sense, they share a lot with certain medieval writers. They're not they so do. They, they really do. They're, 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 they've got this lens on history, which is about good monarchs leading to good things and leading to progress. So people like Alfred, uh, who I know you've worked a lot on, do fare well here and are, if anything, their achievements exaggerated. Um, and those who don't make the mark are then held up in the reverse one. And there, there's not much desire to understand them on their own term. So it is, it is, this, it is this tendency to uh, move away from shades of grey into the nice blacks and whites uh, moral blacks and whites they can operate with. That view was really challenged and changed by your mentor, Dr. Simon Keynes. Yeah, so I think it really was in the 1970s. I think it was kind of probably two people operating differently that, that, that really got things going. That we had on the one hand, Pauline Stafford, right. uh, which I know you know extremely well, who was already moving very strongly towards that in her, her Oxford D. Phil thesis of 1973, some bits of which she then published in 1978 in the millennial volume celebrating the start of his reign, to which Simon Keynes contributed his own first article and kind of marked his coming of age as a scholar. Um, and at the same time, Simon Keynes, my old supervisor, had been working in Cambridge just a few years later and completed uh, a fellowship thesis there in 1976, which eventually then was adjusted into his doctoral thesis of 1978. And he'd been working with the kind of charter materials. But the upshot of both was uh, approaching by different means. Pauline Stafford was interested in kind of factions at court and Simon Keynes more uh, at how he could organically uh, build up a picture of how his reign evolved. So both came to a very similar conclusion, which is actually Ethelred wasn't a rotter. He wasn't stupid. Lots of his policies were sensible. He was also operating under all sorts of other constraints not of his own making. And so Stafford and Rich em emphasized those constraints of the noble family, some things you were just talking about earlier, um, where Simon was more interested in emphasizing the degree to which the negative view we have is a product of later sources writing with hindsight, knowing his brain ends bad. And the crucial thing being is the 38-year reign, as you've alluded to, it's the longest reign of anybody of this dynasty. No crisis can go on for 38 years, at least not an acute one. And so in a sense, we've tended to take those crisis moments of the last five to 10 years, maybe even 15 yes. years of his reign, which are pretty grim. Uh, um, and I think Simon would now emphasize even more strongly than he did in his early publications how grim they were. But we've tended to take those and paint the entire reign in that manner uh, and, uh, and kind of read them backwards. And actually, if you let the evidence speak for itself, if you look at the coinage, the operation of Reeves, all of these suggest uh, a well-operating uh, regime. And, and, and if Ethelred dies in the year 1000 or 1001, I know we've spoken about this on other occasions, yeah. he goes down not as a hugely successful ruler, but not as a complete failure. He goes down as a kind of mixed bag, perhaps. One of the reasons why England is under attack is because it is a successful kingdom. Mm. It's rich. It's prosperous. An evidence of the success of the governmental structures of England was England's ability to raise enormous sums of money to pay geld to the Vikings. I don't think there's any other kingdom, at least in Western Europe, that could have raised money 
on this level and supplies on this level. Uh, that's very impressive. Yes. No, as you say, in a sense, England is somewhat a victim of its own success. It's sufficiently centralized that it can raise lots of cash, which makes it the goose that lays the golden egg. That's why the Vikings don't want to get rid of it. Even when they come in and conquer it, they just want to own the goose then. Yes. Take it over entirely. But uh, they want to keep milking England because actually it's completely worth it. But the other thing is that because this is, particularly from Edgar onwards, an increasingly uh, uh, centralized state that operates relatively well by medieval standards, obviously a long, far cry from modern states. But because of that, it also means that it can be conquered in a way that regions where power structures are much more devolved can't be. You know, try doing that to Wales in this period. Oh, yeah, Multiple right. Multiple kingdoms, uh, a hostile geography. It's never going to happen. Whereas England is a kingdom that you can come in, knock off the monarch, and then take over, as happens briefly during Ethelred's reign, or almost happens in the process of happening, uh, when Swain Fortbeard comes over in 1013 to 14, and then happens at his death with Canute, is already in process when he dies. And that, of course, happens later in 1066 with William the Conqueror. The, the precedent has been set. But England is a very powerful. But because of that, the, the, the ironic counterpoint to that is it, the features that make it capable of raising large armies and large sums of money also enable conquerors to take it over with an ease they could very few other European kings. And when they do take it over, they become English monarchs. That's what Canute is. Canute presents himself with the help of uh, Archbishop Wolfstad as being an English monarch, and that's what William does. He is a successor, a legitimate successor, to Edward the Confessor. If you can decapitate the realm, you can become the new head of the realm. Precisely. But it also kind of explains then the success of England itself, that these waves of conquest don't actually kill it off, as it were, or kill off English identities. You might have otherwise wondered or speculated. One of the, you know, uh, big questions of the Norman conquest, why did the English not become Normans? When when the English came over, they became English with the Anglo-Saxon yes. settlement that, you know, uh, that latter case, it's unlikely that the groups that came over constituted a complete majority, certainly not in all regions, certainly not where I'm sitting right now in Devon. They were definitely a minority, yet the majority of people ended up speaking English and identifying as English. So there was a, a cultural shift as well as any population shift. So right. one could imagine a model in which the English became Normans, but they absolutely didn't. And one of the reasons is that England had a real power as a structure and actually uh, the Normans come within a few generations to want to actually identify with it and to be truly Anglo-Norman, to be Englishmen who just happen to speak French. If I were Canute, I'd much rather have the power, the authority, and the instruments of power that an English king would had than have the governmental structures of Denmark or Norway. And if I were a Norman duke like William, I would be delighted to have the power and, again, the instruments of power, the institutions of power that an English king had. You don't, you don't get rid of things that benefit you. Precisely. So let me ask you, do you think that Athelred was unready in any of the senses of the word? Yes, but I'm not sure it's reasonable to have expected him to be ready, would be my oh. caveat. I think it's Walter okay. also. Explain. So I think you probably are right that he's not, certainly not fully ready militarily for the, the Viking attacks, but I don't think anybody else in England thinks they're going to come. I agree. It's not the case that he's been daft. And that's always been my main take on his reigns. I do think that some things he's been blamed for he shouldn't be. But I think the biggest thing is actually we should be looking to understand him rather than judge him. And most things he gets wrong, he doesn't get wrong for dumb reasons. He gets wrong because most people around him and most other people in England think the same. And so they think the Viking, at least as a force that comes over from Scandinavia rather than some of the groups in the British Isles, are a thing of the past. They are wrong, but Ethelred's not, I think, alone in thinking this, and I think his father perhaps already is expecting this. Yes. I think that's the kind of crucial thing. I think a lot of the things that he, he gets wrong there are a product of a general political consensus around these kinds of issues. That, that, that means that the English as a whole have misjudged it because they don't know what's going on in Scandinavia. They don't know Swain Fortbeard's about to come. And once they do know, it's too late. For well, I, Ethelred, think... I think the other thing is that he then because of those events of the 980s and because of his buying into this kind of religious reading of these events, it means that he, he cannot or does not want to pivot to perhaps a more military response, that, that, that the military is for him 
not insignificant, but it's always secondary to the religious yeah. response. Levy, while I very much agree with you that Athelred understood the Vikings as a scourge of God, I would add that this did not prevent him from responding militarily. I don't think Athelred has received sufficient credit for the military reforms he undertook in response to the threat presented by the Vikings. England, as you said, was unprepared at the beginning of Athelred's reign to contend with the military threat posed by large Viking fleets. The military system that King Alfred created in the late 870s and 880s to defend Wessex featured a standing army operating in tandem with garrison fortified towns, complemented by a small royal fleet. Alfred's military system was employed by his son, daughter, and grandsons to extend West Saxon rule over Mercia, East Anglia, and finally Northumbria. The result was the creation of a kingdom of England. But standing armies and garrisons are expensive luxuries in a time of peace. The military system that Athelred inherited was much like the one that Alfred had inherited. The third had returned to being a military levy, summoned in times of need, while burrs were now primarily economic and administrative centers rather than defended fortifications. As a result, the English couldn't defeat Viking armies on land or sea and couldn't protect their towns from being sacked. As Alfred had done a century before, King Athelred and his advisors took steps to deal with the growing threat. They began by addressing the vulnerability of the boroughs. Perhaps as early as the 990s, the king began an ambitious program of military construction. New boroughs were raised on the sites of Iron Age hill forts at South Cadbury in Somerset, Old Sarum in Wiltshire, and Kisbury in Sussex, and the defenses of existing boroughs were refurbished as stone walls replaced timber revetments and palisades. Athelred and his advisors, however, lacked Alfred's strategic vision. The construction was conducted in a piecemeal fashion, exemplified by the new hill forts, each apparently built as a consequence of a threat to or the sacking of an existing mint. Relocated to more defensible locations, often less good ones in terms of travel, though away from rivers but onto hilltops. When the level of Viking activity grew with the arrival of a great fleet in the autumn of 1006, Athelred and his advisors responded by attempting to upgrade England's military forces. The basic strategy they adopted was preclusive, centering on the construction of a massive royal fleet intercept raiders at sea. In 1008, Athelred ordered the kingdom to be divided into naval districts of 300 hides to facilitate the construction and maintenance of a great armada. At the same time, he ordered that a helmet and corslet be supplied from every eight hides of land, quote, from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, unremittingly over all England. If we go by the hideage total of Doomsday Book, and hideage was a tax assessment of land, this would have produced a fleet of about 200 ships and armor for about 9,000 warriors. This is testimony to the effectiveness of English institutions of governance in the early 11th century. It also suggests that soldiers in the English firds had been less well armored, less well armed than their Viking enemies. Athelred used the powerful institutions of governance of late Saxon England to remedy the deficiencies in his military forces. But all these military efforts failed. When a new large fleet led by Thorkel the Tall appeared in 1009, Athelred threw himself and his kingdom on the mercy of God. Echoing Carolingian practice, Athelred responded with an impressive program for national repentance, prayer, and almsgiving. At Elmham and Bath in 1009, the king issued legislation drafted by Archbishop Wolfstan that began with the admonition that, quote, one God shall be loved and honored above all, and all men shall show obedience to their king in accordance with best traditions of their ancestors and cooperate with him in defending the realm. End quote. The legislation decrees that every adult Christian give alms, fast, and pray, and prescribes the litanies that the clergy were to chant to obtain the divine favor necessary for victory. These litanies, contra paganos against the pagans, generally concluded with the threefold invocation of the Lamb of God calling upon Christ, quote, to grant us peace, end quote. Simon Keynes reasonably associates the issuance of Athelred's Agnes Dei coin type in 1009 to the legislation and the enforced litanies. 
This national program of penance, however, proved no more effective than Athelred's diplomatic and military efforts had. Athelred has to shoulder some of the blame for the military defeat of the English. I say this because in an era in which morale was all important and leadership was all important, Athelred himself was a reluctant military commander. So he's not going to inspire and rally the nation the way that Alfred supposedly was able to do. And the people that he gives his trust to as military leaders have no experience. Yeah. That's a problem. You're fighting an enemy that is experienced. And I, and I'm actually impressed that among the things that Athelred does try is he tries to turn Olaf Tryggvason into an ally and to make problems for Canute back at his Scandinavian homeland. And that's works. impressive. It works at least in the short term. So it doesn't stop all the Viking attacks because there's other groups operating, but it stops Swain Forkbeard attacking for the best part of a decade. So it does. That there, are, there are individual moments of success dotted throughout his reign, which again explains how it goes on for 38 years. And one of the problems is that our main narratives, even our main contemporary narrative, that of the Chronicles, you know full well, is written after the fact. So they, the processes of selection that have led to what's included there has tended to highlight those failures because the failures show a kind of natural progression towards the final, ultimate downfall. Um, and it's not that, that those failures aren't real, but those are only one part of the contemporary picture. And if we take them as the whole story, it skews it and it doesn't allow, allow us to understand how actually he does have some of those surprising successes, moments where it looks like actually the policy is working and in the end it doesn't. But but, it, but we need to put ourselves into those moments where actually uh, in the moment people are thinking in the mid-990s, from 994 to 997, there's no more Viking attacks. They, it they, looks they, like they, it's they, they have, yeah. but... You know, it's not dark thinking. They've set up Olaf Tryggvason in Norway. He's creating problems for Swain Forkbeard. Swain Forkbeard, Forkbeard is not the one who comes back in 997. You know, it looks like it's all working for a while. And the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, the main chronicle, is written after the event, probably by a London cleric looking back. And he wants to explain why exactly. the English failed. It's interesting. He doesn't really blame Athelred. He does blame treachery. Yeah. And I think that but much of the treachery that he claims seems to me to be better explained as incompetence on the part of inexperienced military commanders. Yeah. No, and I think actually the, the chronicler, I think, is someone who is sympathetic to Athelred. I think he's actually someone who is part of the group, not necessarily one of his leading advisors, but actually part of a group that was supportive to his regime. And what he's now having to do, though, is in the aftermath, explain its downfall. And so he's looking for those causes at their earliest possible point. And that's what makes his account fascinating, but also problematic. And I think it's I think it can be taken as a reasonable representation of feeling at Court Ethelred's last years, even before his death. Yes. But not much before then. That last five, even maybe ten years, it can perhaps speak for those those moments where it's all going very badly wrong and people can kind of start seeing the writing on the wall. Whatever the reasons, at least in military terms, Athelred's reign is a failure. And that's what he gets taught with. Athelred might be blamed for his reluctance to lead troops in the field, but his and his advisor's greatest deficiency was a lack of a coherent strategic vision. One may question the Anglo-Saxon chronicler's theme of treachery and disloyalty, but he was a keen observer and appreciated that the root cause of defeat was not the policies, but their faulty implementation and the inconstancy with which they were followed. As a result, in his words, when the enemy was in the east, then the army was in the west, and when they were in the south, then our army was in the north. Then all the counselors were ordered to the king, and it then had to decide how this country should be defended but whatever was then decided, it did not stand for even a month. In the end, there was no headman who wanted to gather an army, but each fled as best as he could, nor in the end would one shire help another. Well, I think there's one more thing I'd, I'd like you to, to talk a little bit about, is how Athelred's reign helps prepare us for Norman England. 
So, yes, infamously, famously, it's in Ethelred's reign that we first get this Anglo-Norman connection that would have such a future. Because one of the problems for him, of course, is the, the perennial problem from the 990s onwards, from 991 onwards, is the Viking attack. And so he's doing whatever he can to stop them. You've already mentioned this, that one of the things he does is he uh, creates an alliance with Olaf Tryggvason, buys him off, sends him back to Norway, Olaf becomes king of Norway against the wishes of the Danish king, Swain Forkbeard. That creates problems there, internecine strife in Scandinavia. Great news for Ethelred. The other thing he's trying to do is reach out to the ducal court in Normandy. There's some evidence of contact and discussions already in the 990s, but crucially in 1002, at a time when Ethelred's first wife may now have passed away. We don't know much about her. She's a very shadowy figure. But crucially, in 1002, he contracts a second marriage to Emma of Normandy, who is of the Norman ducal house. And this is tying Ethelred to her brother, the duke. Uh, and crucially, it's meant to close the Norman ports because Normandy has been a Scandinavian foundation and there's still Old Norse being spoken, at least in pockets there. So not surprisingly, raiders on England, at least periodically, were choosing to stay in Normandy and use it as a, a base to go across the channel. Uh, as one would do. And so Ethelred is hoping by this marriage to be able to shut those ports and uh, therefore close off one potential source of support for uh, the Vikings that are troubling his realm. So that leads him to marry Emma, who is his second wife, who is herself a real power, a little bit like Ethelred's own mother at court, um, and goes on to have a glittering uh, uh, future in English politics, very controversial, but glittering future in English politics. And it's that union that then means, though, that his sons with her, uh, including, crucially, the future Edward the Confessor, are also related to the Norman ducal house. So when Edward the Confessor dies without any sons, Duke William of Normandy is a distant relative and can claim, hey, this is mine for the taking. So Athelred is critical in the two conquests of England in the 11th century. Precisely. For those who want to know more about Athelred and more about Normans, I recommend Levy's books. Athelred the Unready is the book to read on Athelred. It's also the longest book on Athelred and my little book for Penguin is the shortest book on Athelred. So we have the long and short of it here. And for those who want to know more about Normans, I recommend Empires of the Normans, a wonderful read. And I want to thank Levy for being on my podcast. Thank you very much. And I would merely emphasize to the readers, they should absolutely also read uh, the shorter Penguin Ethelred of yours that I think also, if you're looking for different kind of takes, I think they're two very complementary takes that you've got on the one hand, your background and knowledge as a military historian and uh, highlighting those military problems. And for me, it's more of a, a court focus and ideological religious focus. So you'll also kind of get uh, different pieces of the picture. Neither, I think, book deny, neither book, I think, denies the other, but I, I think they're, they're, they work very nicely as a pairing. So certainly I always set my students on both. So listeners, please do go out and buy my book and Richard's. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Levy. That was, that was fun. Until next episode, bye for now. Bye. bye.